Amen. Somebody say it with me. It's everywhere I go. Amen. See, the church is not a building. It's not a location. Church is people. Church is people. We are the church, and wherever we go, we can take church with us. Amen. And so I want to welcome our online family. So glad you guys are here today. Uh, be sure to share our content for today, and let's take this message as far as we can possibly take it. Amen. Amen. So uh, welcome back, family. I hope everybody had a, uh, enjoyed their, their Thanksgiving. And um, that being said, we want to move right into the Word. Is everybody ready? Say amen. I want to talk to you today on this, this topic, defining moments. Defining moments. Go ahead and say it with me. Defining moments. I want to tell you today that um, when God sees you move in your moments, he will move in your moments. I want to talk to somebody today that you're waiting on God to do something, and I want to let you know that he's already done what you're waiting on. You're waiting on him. He's waiting on you. Amen. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, you might want to move. Amen. It's time to make a move. So I want to read today from Acts chapter 4, verse number 31. Again, I want to speak on this thought, defining moments. I, um, I do believe that we are at the point of, of, of breakthrough and breakout, and I believe that there are going to be moments that are going to begin to present themselves to you. I believe these are moments for your advancement, and I don't want you to miss it. Now, I want to go ahead and tell you that it may not look like you thought it was going to look. Sometimes when your moment presents itself, it doesn't present itself in a package that you thought it was going to be in. It may not surrender itself to you. You might have to take it. Amen. Somebody karate chop your neighbor and just say, get ready to take something. So in Acts chapter 4, verse number 31, the scripture says this, when they had prayed, the place where they assembled together was shaken. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and they spoke the word of God with boldness. The word boldness in the Greek is the word parisia and it simply means a free and a fearless confidence. That the church was filled with a free and a fearless confidence. And I want you to know that I'm... Um, I came today with a few goals in mind, and one of those is this, is that before you leave today, I want to believe God for you and with you, that God would fill you with a supernatural confidence that when this shift begins to occur in your life, that you'll rise to the occasion and you'll take your moment. Somebody say amen. Amen. Lord, we pray that you bless the reading of your word today. We pray that we would be not just hearers of it, but doers of it of the word in Jesus name and everybody said amen amen um, so we prayed for a bunch of people a minute ago and when we met with our serve team earlier this morning I asked them this question I told them I said hey we're gonna interrupt the worship service and we're gonna pray for folks isn't that a crazy idea that we'll stop having church so we can do church isn't that that's kind of a novel idea, right? You know what I mean? I don't know if you know this or not, but prayer is the business of the church. That's what the church is supposed to be about, you know. It'd be like McDonald's saying, hey, hey guys, why don't we do this today? Let's sell hamburgers. Let's do that. Amen. Like that, like that was a great idea they had. And for the rest of us, we would just say, no, that's what you do. I, I just have this crazy idea that if the church will just get back and do what it does, that it'll be fine. Amen. It, Stop doing all the things that you don't do and be great at what you do. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so Jesus said, my father's house is to be called a house of prayer. And you made it a den of thieves. Oh, how did you make it a den of thieves? Well, my God, we take up too many offerings. Well, that, that ain't popular. Amen. So I do believe in tithes and I believe in offerings and stuff like that. But uh, I also believe you're supposed to give some stuff away. Oh, that's good preaching right there. Amen. You're supposed to give some stuff away. The reason we give tithe and offering in the church is so that as a body we can do more than we could individually. Oh, come on, somebody. Amen. I can help a few people along the way. You know, I've got a, listen, I got some snacks and some bottled water that I keep with me so I can help a few people that are thirsty and hungry. I always keep a little cash on me so if I see somebody needs some money, I put a little money in their hand. I do that every day of my life. 
Somebody told me, said, Pastor, you got to quit saying that. We're, we broadcast worldwide. Somebody's going to know you got cash on them. I also got a gun on me. Come on, somebody. Amen. And so um, you ain't got, I'll, if you just tell me you need it, I'll give it to you. All right. Amen. But if you try to take it, I'll give that to you as well. All right. Amen. Woo. Thank you, Jesus. Second Amendment. All right. Amen. We want to serve people, want to help people, and I can help people one at a time, but the reason we give tithe and offering in the church is so we can make a bigger impact. So I can take my little bit and you can take your little bit and we put it together and we can not just change a moment, but we can change a life. Does that make sense? Amen. But at the same time, whenever we begin to preach things like, well, if you bring your money here, God's going to send you miracle money. Amen. I, I haven't really found that anywhere as I've read the scripture. I do believe in giving, but I just want to say this is why we give. We give so we can give. Does that make sense? Let me say it again. We give so we can give. Pastor, you believe that God blesses his people? I sure do. He blesses a cheerful giver. All right. Amen. That's how somebody told me one time, I said, how come my church isn't blessed? I said, because y'all mad. God blesses a cheerful giver. Y'all mad all the time. Complain about everybody and everything. Always upset and angry and shaking your fists. And, I don't like this. I don't like that. Be happy. Smile a little bit. Learn to love people again. I wonder what would happen if the church started loving people again. Oh, that's good preaching. I can tell right now I'm, I'm preaching to a group of people that um, may not be ready for what's next. All right. That's okay. I'll drag you along till you get there. In 1 Samuel chapter 14, in verse number 4, I want to talk to you about a young man named Jonathan. Jonathan is the prince of Israel. His, his dad is Saul, the king. They are engaged in warfare. They are under attack and they are besieged and they are fighting a, a force that is 10 to 1 outnumbering them. Israel has positioned itself in a place where they can retreat where if the battle does begin, they can get away. They haven't positioned themselves strategically to fight the battle. They've positioned themselves that if we are attacked, we can get out of this thing. And that's where we pick up here in verse number four. It says, between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines garrison, there was a sharp rock on one side and a sharp rock on the other side. And the name of one was Bozes and the name of the other was Sinah. And the front of one faced northward opposite of Michemash and the other southward opposite of Gibeah. Family, the word Bozes means a place of shining and the word Sana means a place of thorns. And so Jonathan was trying to get closer to the enemy. Everybody say that with me, closer to the enemy. Most of us are trying to get farther away from our enemies, right? But Jonathan said, I'm going to get closer to the enemy. And on his way there, he was climbing up the side of a cliff and he found himself between two sharp rocks. These rocks were so significant that they named them. One was called Shining and one was called Thorns. And I believe that's a perfect example, uh, a perfect picture of us trying to achieve our destiny, trying to, uh, to, to get to that next place in life. Seems like life just has a way of always putting you between the rock and the hard place, doesn't it? Always having to pass over the thorns so you can get to the shiny places in life. And in verse number six, it says that Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, come and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that the Lord will work for us. For nothing restrains the Lord from saving by many or by few. So his armor bearer says to him, do all that is in your heart. Go then for I am here with you according to your heart. Some of us, again, have withdrawn from the battle. I want to go ahead and tell you the last two years that we've lived, it's been easy to withdraw from everything else that's going on. As a matter of fact, there's certain seasons of our life, it has been mandated to us that we would withdraw, that we would, you know, hey, don't be around people. Wear masks and uh, social distance and shelter in place. And before you try to figure out which side I'm on, praise God, listen, I'm sick to death of every debate that's out there. It's either wear a mask or don't wear a mask. It's get a vaccine or don't get a vaccine. It's Black Lives Matter, it's All Lives Matter. 
Can, can the church not see that there's a spirit of division that would like to separate people? And, and too many church people are, are more interested in their politics than they are in what our practice should be, and that's just to love everybody. Oh, that's good preaching. You ain't even got to clap for me. I'll just say it again. Our practice is to love everybody. Amen. Listen, I don't care. If you got a mask on, I love you. If you don't, I love you. You got the vaccine. You didn't get the vaccine. I got it. Somebody told me the other day, said, oh, I can't believe you got that, Pastor. I can't believe you got that. I said, why not? Oh, you don't know what's in it. <laughs> I don't know what's in chicken nuggets either, but praise God. There's more people will die of obesity this year <laughs> than of side effects from the vaccine. But you ain't, you ain't got a picket sign in front of McDonald's. Come on, somebody. We just telling you because we care about you. Hey, but why didn't you care when you saw me pulling up at Bella Napoli's and getting that big lasagna? You didn't say nothing. You didn't say nothing then. You know what I say? I say, let every man work out his own salvation in fear and trembling before the Lord. Somebody said, how did you make your decision? Well, I listened to the people that were for it. I listened to the people who were against it, and I took all that information. I went and prayed about it, and what I had peace with is what I acted on. And that's what I would tell everybody in the church. Man, just do you. Just be you. And stop. Thank you, but be you and stop hating everybody that ain't you. Let me finish. Amen. Now you can clap. You see, I believe the church has a, 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 a greater call. I believe we're supposed to be busy about the Father's business. I think there's a work for us to do. We need to learn how to love people again. You need to learn how to love people that don't look like you. Learn people, love people that, that, that don't live where you live. Love people that don't vote like you. Come on, somebody. You love everybody. I don't know if you know this about love or not, but love is perfect. It's per it never fails. That's what the scripture said. Love never fails. Why do we keep using things that may or may not work whenever we know that if you use love, it will do what you sent it to do every time? Let's take a little, let's take a test real quick. Have you, has anybody in the room ever been in love before? Oh, come on. Anybody in the room in love right now? You're looking around. Some of you might get in trouble. Any of you ever been in love before and you were convinced it was the right one? Anybody ever been in love before and you found out later it was the wrong one? Was the love real, but the relationship was wrong? The love was real, but the person was toxic. Oh, come on, somebody. You come too late to tell me anything else. I just sat with too many people over too many years that fell in love, got married, and then had to come talk to the preacher. Oh, come on, somebody. Pastor, I don't understand how everything went wrong so fast. We were in love. It's because you didn't understand what love was. Love is perfect, and it'll go wherever you send it to go, and it'll do everything that you send it to do, even if you send it to the wrong place and the wrong person. Love will still go, and it'll still be real. And I'm just talking to a church saying, guys, we got to learn how to love again. Pastor, I thought you were talking about defining moments. I want to talk first about how you're going to recognize and receive that moment. If you don't know how to operate in love, you will miss your moment every time. Can't be selfish in these things. Can't be self-serving in these things. You got to learn, you got to learn to give it all away. Give of yourself and love people. Re-engage in the battle. Some of you, a couple years ago, you, you were focused and you were ready to take life by the throat. And now you've disengaged from everything. It's time to get close to the enemy again. Draw close into the battle again. Like I said, Israel positioned itself ready to retreat. But Jonathan and one man who simply said, go do what you want to do, I got your back. I want to tell you, you ain't got to have a bunch of people to believe in you. If you can just get somebody that'll love you and pray with you and believe in you, you don't need a bunch of people. This man told Jonathan, he said, hey, go on up, I'm with you. 
You want to go fight them all? Let's go. Let's get it on. It's on like Donkey Kong and a pot of neck bones. Let's do this thing. Let's go. Some of us have withdrawn from the battle and you don't know what the enemy's doing in your life now because you ain't close enough to see it. You got to be close enough so you can see the movement of your enemy and the moment of your destiny when it appears. Your moment may not look like you thought it would look because I'm sure that Jonathan thought, I'm going to, whenever I go up this mountain pass, the whole army's going to go with me. And they said, nope, you on your own, brother. We trying to get out of something. We ain't trying to get in something. I'm sure in Jonathan's mind, he thought, man, I'm going to go in here and I'm going to have archers and swordsmen. I'm going to have horses and chariots. They're going to wave flags and blow trumpets. Nope, that ain't how it looked at all. But the moment was still his. The ground was rocky. The cliff was steep. His enemy was great and his followers were few. But the moment was his. In verse number 12 of the same chapter, it says that the men of the garrison called to Jonathan and his armor bearer when they saw him poke his head up. They said, come up to us and we will show you something. Ain't that just like the devil? If you say that again, I'm going to get you. Or if you do that again, I'm going to get you. Have you ever done the right thing in your life and then got a bad result because of it? Are you, have you ever done the right thing, got the wrong result, and then immediately said, well, I ain't going to do that again? I want to help you that whenever you do the right thing, it'll cost you something. When you're doing the right thing for yourself, it's going to cost you something. And when you're doing the right thing for other people, it'll cost you even more. Sometimes we got we to gotta get that in our, in our mind. We need to give it away. Do you know that people can't steal what you give away? Oh, am I helping somebody? There's people in here right now, you got all kind of bad emotions going on because you think somebody took from you. Well, if you just give it away, they can't steal it. Oh, they took advantage of me. You can't take advantage of me. I'm here to give everything away. Oh, they, they, they used me. Well, praise God, that's my design purpose. I'm here to be used. Use me again. Use me again. I had a, a friend of mine call me the other day. He said, Pastor, I got this big promotion and all of a sudden my job is in jeopardy. And, and they've told me I can't do this and I can't say that. I'm doing all this stuff wrong. And he said, I want you to pray with me. I said, I hope they do fire you. I, that's my prayer for you. I pray that they do fire you because I know who you are. I know you're a man of God. I know what you're doing up there. I know who gave you the promotion. I hope they do fire you and watch God give you a better job because of it. There's people in the room right now that's praying that God will give them a better job, but now you're battling depression because you got fired from the old job. Well, he had to get you out of the old before he could put you in the new one. Come on, somebody. Come on, buck up under it, little buckaroo. Wipe those tears away. Go ahead, square your shoulders. Stick out your chin. This might be your greatest moment. And so the enemy says in verse number 12, come up to us. We'll show you something. Jonathan says to his armor bearer, come up after me for the Lord has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Ain't that cool? And the devil said, well, I'm going to show you something. And Jonathan said, that's, that's what I wanted to hear. Told his armor bearer, said, this is it right here, baby. It's go time. Come on, let's go get them. The Lord has delivered them into our hands. I want to go ahead and tell you that every time the devil says he's going to show you something, it's time for you to show him something. And verse number 13 says that Jonathan climbed up on his hands and his knees and his armor bearer after him and they fell before Jonathan as he came after him. His armor bearer killed him. The first slaughter which Jonathan and his armor bearer made was about 20 men in about a half acre of land. Family, when your moment calls to you, move forward. It's not going to call to you when you're ready for it. Move forward. Can I tell you the secret of, of, of my success in life? I want to give you the cheat codes here. For me, in most situations, no doesn't mean no. It just doesn't. Because everything that I've wanted to do in ministry, I've always had somebody that was over me or smarter than me letting me know, no, you can't do it that way. You know what that means to me? Just try again. Oh, come on, somebody. 
I've had city officials and county officials, and I ain't against none of them. I love them all. God bless them all. I hate, uh, I hate that you have to do the job you do. Come on, somebody. <laughs> I hate you got to deal with all these people. <laughs> hey. But I've had to say, Pastor, you can't do church that way. We're going to do it that way anyway. Oh, you can't build that school there. Ta-da. <laughs> you don't have the right approval to build that building. You don't have the right zoning to get that approved there. <laughs> I've been in too many of those meetings. Well, listen, I want to go ahead and tell you that when what you pray about and what you see with your eyes don't look the same, keep praying until it happens. Oh, come on, somebody. Just keep praying until it happens. I told a family this the other day. I said, if what you hear with your ears doesn't line up with what you heard in your prayer closet, then don't believe it. Just move on. Just keep moving. Just keep moving. Well, pastor, sometimes you just got to accept things. I accept that I ain't going to quit till I die. That's what I accept. I accept that you're too important. I accept that my family, my friends, they're too important. I ain't going to give up on nobody. We're going to keep loving and keep trying and keep preaching and keep reaching. We're going to keep teaching. Come on, somebody. We're going to keep sharing Jesus with everybody that we encounter. And we ain't never going to stop. Amen. So I accept that. I accept that. That's what I accept. That's good preaching. I believe that God presents us with all kinds of moments and opportunities. For the first time in the history of the nation of Guatemala, they have a Christian president. President Jimmy. First time in the history of that nation. When he was elected a couple years ago, they asked him, what was the secret of your success? Because he was not a politician. He was a, he was a Guatemalan actor in, in a situation comedies. He was a comedic actor in the nation of Guatemala, not a politician at all. And they wonder, how did somebody like you become the president of the nation? You know what he told him? He called a man's name, Carlos Vargas, and he said, when he backed me, he gave me the heart of the people. Who is Carlos Vargas? Carlos Vargas is the owner and proprietor of the largest mission in the nation of Guatemala, uh, Hope of Life Ministries. They have changed. They have changed the face of that nation. They've attacked poverty. They have put it in a chokehold and they're choking poverty out of the nation. They're bringing financial increase. They're changing the, they're changing the nation one person at a time and one village at a time. They have feeding centers in every major, major garbage dump in the nation where they feed people that live just outside of the garbage dump. They don't just feed them, but they say, hey, whenever you're ready, we're going to get you out of here. When you're ready, we're going to give you an education. When you're ready, we're going to get you a house to live in. When you're ready, we're going to launch you for your future. I had an opportunity to spend a week with Carlos, and I asked him, I said, I asked a few things. One, uh, we were standing on top of his second hospital that they were building. They've already built their first hospital. It's about the size of, of St. Joseph's own um, Abercorn Street. So a lot of times you say somebody, a missionary built a hospital in a third world country, you think about a little mud hut with a red cross on the side, it ain't that. You know, doctors, nurses, ambulances, this thing is eight stories tall, come on somebody. A real hospital with a real emergency room and lab equipment, everything that you need, amen, to help people. And they've already outgrown it, so they're building the second one. And we were standing on the fourth floor of what was under construction, and, and he was only talking about where they're clearing land. He said, because when we finish this one, it's already going to be full. So we started clearing that land over there because we need to continue to build so we can help the people. I thought it was in, in, incredible, and in that moment, when I'm talking to a man who had a dream to build a hospital so he could just give medical care away to people. And in the background, I see that dream built. We're standing on top of what was another dream, but his only conversation is about what we're going to do next. He's not talking about what we did last or what we're doing right now. He only wanted to talk about what we did next. And he kept saying this. He said, I'm not good at a lot of stuff. I'm just a dreamer. I'm just a dreamer. And I asked him, I said, Carlos, what's the biggest dream you got? Amen. Because this place is fantastic. It's 600 acres. They're self-sustaining. They have chickens and cows and fish. 
They have employees. They have orphanages. They have the cleanest nursing home I've ever been to in my life. You ever been to a nursing home? You know that little smell that it has? What if I told you I went to a nursing home didn't have a smell? Didn't even have a smell. Cleanest nursing home I've ever been, into, been to in my life was in Yano Verde, Guatemala, in the Zacapa region. In Guatemala, they take the, uh, if, if you are disabled, they'll just drive you up in the mountains and put you out. And drive back down and leave you there. And so he has teams of people that their job every day is to drive around the mountains and find abandoned people so they can bring them back to their compound. That's all they do. They just bring them back. And so when I ask him, I'm, I'm looking at all this stuff and everything that you do. And man, the president just said that, that he's the president because you said he'd be a good president. This is incredible. What power, what influence, what authority, what passion, what vision. What's the biggest dream you have? And he looked at me and didn't miss a beat. He said, the next one. Hey. The next one. He said, I don't plan on ever stopping. I don't have an ultimate goal. Just every time God leads me to do something, I want to do it. And he said, and I'm raising up people around me that whenever I die, the mission doesn't die. They can just pick up where I left off and they can keep going. And I said, how did you build your first hospital? And this is what he told me. He said, I didn't miss my moment. He said, we had a first aid station that we were operating out of my home. It was a first aid station slash nursing home and we were operating it out of my home. We had 11 elderly people that had been abandoned and they lived in my home. And I talked to my brothers, he had two brothers and he said, we put all of our money together and we cleared the land and we started building the first hospital. He said, we just thought we did what we could do. I was invited to go to the Dominican to speak at a conference and he said, when I got off the plane, somebody was holding a sign that said, welcome Carlos. He said, I walked up to the man and said, I'm Carlos. That's me, I'm Carlos. He said, he put me in a limousine, drove me to a fancy hotel. He said, I'm wearing, I'm wearing a sweatsuit. I got on jogging pants and a, and, a, and, a, and a jogging jacket. I'm wearing a sweatsuit. And they carry me in. Everybody's got coats and ties on. There's this big buffet. Everything's decorated. And he said, I just walked into the room and went around and said, hello, I'm Carlos. <laughs> hello, I'm Carlos. Hi, I'm Carlos. He said, finally, they, uh, they, they led me around to this guy. And I said, hi, I'm Carlos. And he said, you're not Carlos. He said, yes, I am. He said, no, you're not. They were waiting on Carlos Beltrain, the Major League Baseball player. The driver didn't know who he was. They said, you got to get out of here. He said, I'm not getting out of here. You brought me here. Somebody's got to take me back. He said, we can't take you. The driver had to go back and get the real Carlos. He said, then I'm staying right here and I'm eating. He said, I waited. And he said, when the real Carlos got there, I went up and said, hey, Carlos, they thought that you was me and I was you. How about that? Isn't that funny? And he said, I introduced myself and I told him who I was and why I was there. And I told him, I said, before you leave today, I need two minutes of your time. And he said, in those two minutes, I told him everything that God had put in my heart. I gave him every dream. And I told him, he said, I will do whatever I have to do, pay whatever I have to pay. But I want you to come back to, with me to Zacapa and I want to show you what we're doing. He said, a few weeks later, Carlos Beltran was with me. And while we were there, he said, I put him with one of my teams. And we went and we rescued a child. We rescued a baby that they found laying in a ditch. He said, I put that baby in his arms and we drove back to our, to our clinic. And he said, what are you going to do? He said, we're going we're to worm this baby. We're going to hydrate this baby and we're going to nourish this baby. He said, what are you going to do after that? We're going to put this baby in an orphanage. He said, this baby needs real medical care. This baby needs a hospital. He said, I'm glad you said that. And he said, get in the truck. And he said, I drove him around and showed him what we started building. And I told him what the dream was. And he said, well, what's it going to take? And he said, he said, we need $6 million to finish this project. And he said, he wrote a check that day. <laughs> when your moment presents itself, you got to be ready. Be bold and confident. I walked into the boardroom before underqualified. But I knew that was supposed to be my job. I had one man look at me and he said, he said, listen, I got 30 people who are more qualified than you. Why should I even consider you? I said, I'll outwork all 30 of them. Call them up and tell them to come right now. What do you do when your moment presents itself to you? And don't shy away from it. 
Like I said, before we leave today, I want to pray over you. I want to pray that the Holy Spirit will come and just shake your world and that you would be filled with that same boldness that they were in Acts chapter 4, that same paresia, that you could take your moment. When's the last time that you really tapped into the thought process of God? What do you want me to do? See, I believe that we all have things that we do in life, but I also believe you can be on assignment while you're on assignment. You know, we're praying for miracles this morning. We're praying for a couple of them up on the stage. Uh, Brother Ricky playing the guitar just took his first chemo treatment the other day. We're praying for miracles in his life. Uh, Naomi, who was uh, up here, Naomi singing lead this morning while her husband is fighting for his life in the hospital this morning. Be ready to move in your moment. Be ready to seize your moment. Don't worry about the things that you can't control. Invest in the things that you can and just trust God for the rest of it. Come on, somebody. In verse number 15, and I said everything else just so I could get here. I didn't even have to preach the message. I could have just done this, but then you would have, you said, well, Pastor, we gave an offering and you didn't preach long enough. So here we go. In verse 15, it says, there was a trembling in the camp and in the field and among all the people. The garrison and the raiders also trembled and the earth quaked so that it was a very great trembling. So Jonathan and his armor bearer climbing up through this crack in the rock. Over the thorns and to the shiny places. And when they finally peek over, their enemy sees them and says, why don't you come up here? We'll show you something. Jonathan looks at his armor bearer and he says, you know what? God could give us victory with a great army or he could do it with just me and you. If I go up there to fight them, will you go with me? And his armor bearer said, well, I've come this far. Go on up and do everything that's in your heart and I'm with you. And Jonathan busted up out of the crack in the ground like a wild man, charged at them. In the first half acre, he had already killed 20 people and everybody that, and everybody that was trying to sneak around said his armor bearer killed all those that come up from behind. He was kicking butt and taking names and about to take the whole field and all of a sudden the ground underneath him begins to shake. This great trembling, it wasn't that the people were Afraid, and they began to tremble because it says the ground was shaking. An earthquake began to happen. This is what I believe. I believe that whenever Jonathan rose up and took the field, I think that God took the field. I think what they felt was God moving in their moment. I want to encourage somebody today and tell you that when you move in your moment, God will move in your moment. That a lot of the things that we're praying about, and God, I want you to do this and want you to do that, God said, listen, I've already prepared it. I've already set it up. I've already done it. All you got to do is move in it. When God sees us move in our moment, that's when he moves in our moment. All you have to do is move. Aren't you ready to launch out? Aren't you ready to take the world by storm? Aren't you ready to be the change? Is anybody in this room, and you don't have to raise your hand, I'm just asking before I pray for you, is there anybody that you came in here today anxious and fearful, waiting for the other shoe to fall. Waiting for something to go wrong. Worry is when you invest energy in something that might not happen. You know that, don't you? <laughs> Worry is when you invest energy in something that might not happen. How much of yourself do you give away to things that may not happen? When I was in corporate America, I'll never forget, I was in a board meeting and this big man from Riverdale, California was there and he was letting us all know how we were replaceable and we could all be fired if we didn't get production up. You, anybody ever been in those meetings? Like you ain't really saying a whole lot, you just flexing, right? And we're sitting there, and I just got, I don't know, it was just one of those days I was happy. And I had a big smile on my face. And he looked at me, he said, you'll be the first one to go. I said, do what you got to do. This job kind of sucks. 
Do you know how much we pay you? Not enough for the headache, I promise, sir. Do you want to be fired? Not really, but if that's what's going to go down, do it now before we finish the day. Come on. He called the meeting off, wanted to meet with me privately, and he said, what's wrong with you? I said, nothing's wrong with me. Everything's right with me. He said, didn't you hear what I said? Don't you have a wife and children? And I just told you that I will take your job away from you. And I said, you can't take away from me what you didn't give me, sir. I was looking for a job when I found this one. Go ahead and do whatever you want to do, and God will give me another one, a better one than this one. Help yourself. And he said, oh, you one of them kind, I said, Every day and twice on Sunday. Come on. I don't know if you know it or not. This world is weird. And so I just decided to be weird too. But I'm a different kind of weird. I'm that kind of weird that is happy and hopeful. I'm that kind of weird that, listen, it, it, it could all be raining. Amen. And I say, well, I like being wet. Come on, somebody. I wanted to be wet today anyway. Hallelujah. Amen. Listen, life is what you make it. Life is a gift. And it's filled with opportunities and moments. Stop looking back and stop looking down and start looking forward. And start praying and asking God, God, what do you want me to do? What do you have for me to do? Because I promise you what God wants for you is better than what you want for you. And what he has laid out before you is greater than anything you could design on your own. And whenever you get in that vein and you begin to pursue the Lord like that and you allow your life to line up with his will, there ain't enough devils in hell or CEOs in boardrooms to keep you from what God wants to do in your life. Amen. Come on, let's stand together this morning.